Let's take our Bibles tonight. I'm going to give you a little time to find it. Find the book of Joel. I know we've studied the book of Joel throughout this past week, and it's one of our favorite ones to study, right? Well, it is a good one, but it's probably one of the more neglected uh, books of the Bible. Dr. J. Vernon McGee writes this, though, about the book of Joel. He says, The prophecy of Joel may seem unimportant as it contains only three brief chapters. However, this little book is like an atom bomb. It is not very big, but it sure is powerful and potent. It wouldn't take you long to read the book of Joel in its entirety. Uh, you could do that tonight. But what you see in the book of Joel uh, and what we will look at tonight, I think we would completely agree with Dr. McGee. The book of Joel is a fantastic book to study. To understand the book of Joel, we have to understand that Joel is primarily prophetic. So it is pointing deep into the future, but at the same time, there is going to be partial fulfillments that will take place. And as we look at this tonight, in Joel chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, the book is exciting because it demonstrates so many applications to God's plan of love and redemption to His people. In John th or Joel 3.16, the Bible says, "...the Lord also shall roar out of Zion." And utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Doesn't that sound like an awesome verse just totally by itself? I mean, you could take that verse, you can lift that right off the pages, and you can see God's plan of love and redemption just in that one verse. And to think that, that the Lord is going to be the hope of his children and of Israel. I mean, that is a terrific verse. It gets even better, though, when you put the entire book of Joel together and you notice how this applies. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Since there's only three chapters to the book of Joel, uh, we're going to be able to study this book. And it's, it's amazing what we see. The first thing we look at is the past. The past in Joel chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. The past, the past for the nation of Israel, and specifically as we deal with Judah here, the past is a past of ongoing sin. And as we see God's plan for the nation of Israel as a whole, and then they divided into the two separate kingdoms, we see that neither one of the kingdoms walked right with God. They would pledge that they would, they would promise that they would, but it wasn't long before they started drifting. And this is another time that we see in the life of Judah that they have drifted from God. What specifically, though, is being talked about? In verse 5, awake ye drunkards. Awake ye drunkards. In fact, this is the sin uh, that is mentioned in this book, that of being drunkards. What exactly is being talked about here? Judah being a, accused of drunkenness. I think, first of all, we have got to take this absolutely literally. Because as he calls them this, uh, the Jewish people have evidently become a land of sots, inebriated and living the life of the common and the destitute. They are living a life that is beneath the calling that God had placed on them as those of Israel. Turn in your Bible, if you will, keep a marker here, but let's go back to the book of Proverbs chapter 31. And we are about to get incredibly culturally incorrect. In Proverbs chapter 31, the Bible tells us in verses 4 through 7, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that's ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. But Lemuel, it is not for kings. It is not for princes. It's beneath them to do that. Go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 19. How does that really apply to the nation of Israel? 
In the book of Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, the Bible lays out how God views his children, how he views the nation of Israel, and in a moment we'll see how God views you and I as believers in Christ. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 5, the Bible says here, now, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. The Israelites were to view themselves as a chosen people, a holy nation, as a nation of priests. They were to be the religious leaders of this world. For you and I as believers in Christ, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are living in a time culturally where we are hearing more and more churches defend drinking. We are hearing more and more churches defend social drinking. We have pastors in our own town, and we can tell you by personal experience of having seen them put the booze in their shopping carts that drink. Oh, and see, nothing wrong with it because it's just social drinking. What's wrong with that? You know, you've heard all the arguments to it, and tonight, without getting into all those arguments, and I believe 100%, and, and again, I'm not getting into that tonight, but I believe 100% that it is wrong for the child of God to be drinking alcohol. I believe that with all of my heart tonight, and I can back that up biblically. But I'm going to come at this from a different direction tonight, rather than all those arguments this evening. Without getting into those, let me tell you a good reason why the Christian should not drink, whether it be socially or otherwise. It is because of Jesus, and because we Christians are better than that. We are better than that. I don't say that in an arrogant fashion. I don't mean any pride involved in that whatsoever. But we are better than that. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are better than dipping down to the lowest elements of our society. What good has ever come out of a person drinking? And the answer is nothing. In fact, I loved it. Not that I like the news, but did you notice in the news this past week that they are discovering a link between drinking alcohol and cancer? They'll probably come out with a vaccine for that. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. You see, as a child of God, you and I are not supposed to be drunk with wine wherein is excess. We are to be intoxicated with the Holy Spirit of God. And if a Christian says, I need a beer, I need a glass of wine to relax, what are they really saying about themselves? If they're saying, I need that to fit in with the group that I'm with, what does that say about that group that you're with? And what does that say about you? You see, the whole testimony behind the individuals that call themselves Christians that are drinking, it goes contrary to the Word of God. How in the world can you call that holy and separate? How in the world can you say it's being a testimony and a witness for the one who has called you royalty? I mean, think, O Lemuel, it is not for kings and princes to imbibe, to drink. Christians... It's not for princes. What is, what is the definition of a prince or a princess? Excuse me, ladies. What is the definition of a prince or a princess? It is a, a child of the king. How many of you tonight are the child of a king? It is not for us. Why would we lower ourselves? Why would we debase ourselves and take ourselves to the lowest element of society? Why would we do that? There's all sorts of other reasons that we can get into, but we're not going to do that tonight. You know, you and I, when we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible said that old things are passed away. That's part of the old life. For some of you, it definitely was a part of your old life. Others of you say, no, it never was. But it's still a part of the old life. Old things have passed away. All things. Not just some things. All things have become new. Now, this whole idea of drunkenness for Judah, I think it can also be taken metaphorically as well. 
on top of what we have just seen, because the nation of Judah uh, is drunk on sin and their rebellion against God. They have become more and more resistant to God's word and what God has told them to do and drunk on their own way of thinking. Judah is drunk on the world. They have dabbled in all the things that the world has to offer. Judah is also just like the nation of Israel. Judah is drunk on idolatry. We see that all throughout the Old Testament, how they have blended in with the different cultures and the places where they have been, and they are drunk with idolatry. They have brought in the idols of the pagan nations right into Israel, right into Judah. And the children of God are worshiping those. Notice something else. Joel, go back to Joel chapter 1 and verse 13. Joel chapter 1 and verse 13. This is their past. This is where they've been. And actually, truthfully, it is their present as well. The Bible says in verse 13 of Joel chapter 1, Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. The priests have neglected to lead the people. Not only have they indulged the people in the things that the people have wanted to do, but it seems like the priests are doing the same things that the people are supposed to be, do, or that the people are doing. The priests are supposed to have led the people the right way, and they're not doing the job. They're not in, in bringing the people into a place of worship. It's just selfish indulgence. Let me tell you, I really believe with all of my heart that throughout this land, there are pastors who are not doing the job that they ought to be doing as a pastor. They are not leading, they are not teaching the people the Word of God, and they are going to answer for that someday. It is dangerous that if a person who, who has that office of a pastor is not preaching the Word of God, instant in season and out of season, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and doctrine, it is a dangerous, dangerous thing. It's been years ago now that we were in Orlando, and uh, we went to uh, a Baptist church on a Sunday morning, and I looked the church up, and it was just kind of nice to go to this. I'll be honest with you. I went to the church because of the organ. It was an independent Baptist church that had this amazing pipe organ, and they had pipes, I mean, up the walls and all around the backside. I thought, oh, I want to hear that thing. You know, the doctor said, yeah, I agree with the doctoral statement. Boy, and I agree with that organ. That's awesome. And I wanted to see that thing. And I wanted to hear it. And that was the most awfulest service, preaching-wise, that I had been to. But they had a guest speaker coming on Sunday night and really wanted to hear that guest speaker. So, all right, well, if the preacher ain't preaching, that's okay. Well, the guest speaker. So we went to it. And Sunday night service, kind of like every Sunday night service in America, where the Sunday night crowd is about half of the Sunday morning crowd. And the Sunday morning, we were sitting more towards the back. Sunday morning, we was right up front. And it's about a minute before the church service starts, and there's no pastor to be found. He's nowhere. And finally, you see him breezing up the hallway just as fast as he can, and he's got on his leather coat that has racing emblems on it and checkered flags and all that kind of stuff. I mean, nothing wrong with that. But the problem was that he had actually been at a race that day, and he couldn't pull himself away from it to get to church on time, and then didn't count, uh, take into account what traffic might be like, and he comes breezing in a minute before the service was to begin, pulling off his leather coat real quick, so he can look, uh, you know, and just ha ha, he he, I look at me kind of a thing. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to absolutely be kidding me. You know what that told me about that pastor? He don't care anything about his flock. He don't care about his church. But that stupid race meant more to him than being in the house of the Lord at a decent time, much less a 60-second warning. That's unbelievable. How in the world the priests that are here that are supposed to be leading Israel are not doing the job. That is the past, and it's also the present. Looking in Joel chapter 1, verse 14, consider the petition. The petition from Joel, it says in verse 14, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Go to chapter 2, in verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, 
Turn ye even to me with all of your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering, and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a feast or a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts, and let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord. And give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Where, where to, wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? The petition is to repent. To repent. Joel is calling Judah to repentance. They have drifted so far from God and they don't even realize how far that they have gotten from God. And you know what? I believe that as Americans, we don't recognize how far we've gotten away from God. Yeah, we're in church, and we think, well, goody for me, you know, look at all those other people that aren't in church. I carry my Bible, look at all those that don't carry a Bible. And we, we pat ourselves on the back for those things. But how far have we drifted from God? How, you, what Brother uh, Zacharias was saying this morning when the Lord talks about following Him and what that means. And I guess I had never thought about that the way he presented that. How can we call ourselves a follower of God when we can't remember the last person that we've told personally about Jesus Christ. How can we call ourselves a follower? Uh, we're, we're a fan, maybe, but not a follower. There's, the church is full of fans, but how many followers? Because if we are following the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are going to be about the Father's business that our elder brother was about. We're going to be wanting to tell people about Jesus. The petition. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we have the familiar verse, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. How many of you tonight agree that America is a land that desperately needs healed? And the Bible tells us how to do it. But it all goes back to the Christian. It all goes back to the church. It all goes back to the petition. Why is this petition so important? Because in Joel it tells us that the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord. Whenever you see that reference, the day of the Lord, uh, just in your mind think the day of the Lord and, and two little words or sound words. Uh-oh. When you see that phrase, the day of the Lord, uh-oh. Because the Lord's coming. And He's coming in judgment and it is righteous judgment. And the day of the Lord is coming. Prophetically speaking, the day of the Lord, we see that poured out throughout the tribulation period. And we see that at Armageddon. And we see that at the entry and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. But we're also going to see that played out at the end of the millennial reign. As the nations are, are, are squashed finally. We're going to see it there. But we see little tidbits of it all the time. The day of the Lord's wrath. You know, that ought to cause you and I as believers in Christ to examine ourselves, and you say, well, we're not under God's wrath, and I 100% agree. But if the world is warned about the wrath of God, should we not be warned about the chastisement of a father? How many of you would be honest enough to say that you had just a little bit of a respectful fear of your daddy? <laughs> and you remember how we were always told you get in trouble at home? Oh, yeah, you get, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. If you get in trouble at school, finish it out. There you go. And I heard that you're getting it twice as bad at home. Did that not put a little bit of fear in you? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean that we walk the straight and narrow like we should all the time. Maybe we were a little sneakier because we knew what was coming. But you think about how many things that that kept us from. And there were certain things that I would not do because I was scared to death of dad. And I knew how fast he could pull that belt off. And I could hear it coming through the loops. You know, <laughs> yeah, oh boy. Mm. Still push the limits. I admit that, but I still push the limits. And you think about that. We have a heavenly father who loves us. And he has no problem chastising us. 
And knowing that the day of the Lord's wrath is coming where a lost person is concerned, do we not see that as believers in Christ, that we have got to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise? That's the petition. Joel chapter 2. Let's look at the prophecy. Joel chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. For it is nigh at hand. The day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden, before them and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one upon his path, and when they fall upon the sword, and they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. The stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide it? The prophecy. God uses the nations of the world to chastise Israel as a whole. As I said, this section here, dealing with the prophecy. The prophecy has a partial fulfillment. Because we know that Judah and Israel were punished, that God brought in the Babylonians. The book of Habakkuk talks about the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. They are a wicked and a hasty nation. The Assyrians come in, and they take over these people. And and you see the desolation that is in their path. But when you read this here in Joel chapter 2, it sounds like something bigger than that. It sounds bigger than just Babylon. It sounds bigger than just Assyria. And in fact, we know that this is only a partial fulfillment because of something that we're going to see in just a moment. But look with me in Revelation chapter 6. Notice how that time of the tribulation period is described. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12 sounds an awful lot like what we just read in Joel chapter 2. The Bible says in Revelation 6, 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Chapter 8, verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Doesn't that sound exactly like what Joel described? As we read the book of Joel, as I said, it is prophetic, and what is happening at that moment is just a foretaste of what is to come. It's a foretaste of the fulfillment of the prophecy. Remember that prophecy, for the most part, like as you study through the book of the Revelation, prophecy, for the most part, does not have the church in mind. We're not in view. We're just not there. Prophecy, you say, well, where are we then? Well, where are we? We're in heaven. Prophecy is about the events that are taking place on earth. And when you're reading through the Revelation, where is the church at during all this bad stuff? We're up in heaven. The scripture makes that very, very clear. The next big event, church, that we are looking for is not Armageddon. It is not the tribulation period. It is not the great tribulation period. It is not the millennial kingdom. The next great event that we are looking for and actually listening for as well is the sound of the trumpet and the Lord to stop in the clouds in the air and for him to call us home. That is the next big event that we are looking forward to. Then the seven-year tribulation period unfolds. Then the things that we see here in the Revelation, as well as what is prophesied in the book of Joel, is going to unfold. The nations of the world are going to be gathered against Israel, ready to annihilate them. You know, it's amazing how the nations of the world hate Israel. Israel's just not that big on the map, is it? 
And in a second, I'll show you that Israel's size by square miles is the equivalent, it would fit right in between the size of New Hampshire and Massachusetts in square miles. It's just barely on the map. And the nations of the world hate that place. Why do they hate that place? It's because it is God's chosen nation. It has nothing to do with its geography. It has nothing to do with its name. It has nothing to do with, with Middle Eastern people. It all has to do with God. And Satan has risen up from the garden on wanting to defeat God, wanting to be recognized as God, wanting to sit in the heavens as God, wanting to dethrone God, and wanting to make sure that the plan of salvation through the Messiah would not happen. Well, guess what? We have read the end of the book, and we know who wins, and it's not the devil. Joel chapter 3. God has a plan. Joel chapter 3. The first two verses. And by the way, this is how we know that the book of Joel, the partial fulfillment of this, yes, took place. But the fulfillment, the actual fulfillment is future. Joel chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, and there's something to catch, all nations, and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Verse 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither, cause thy mighty ones, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Folks, that is prophetic. The Valley of Decision, the Valley of Jehoshaphat in the Kidron Valley. It is also known as the Valley of Megiddo. It is the place of Armageddon. The nations of the world will be brought there. Not of their own free will, mind you. They will be compelled. You will come to this, this judgment. And the judgment there in that Valley of Decision is final. It is absolutely final. And there the nations of the world will be defeated. God has brought His people back to Israel. And by the way, you read uh, the book, I think it's Ezekiel chapter 37, where Ezekiel chapter 37 talks about the two sticks. This divided kingdom, and right now Israel is a divided kingdom. You hear all the time about Israel and Palestine? Uh-huh. It's going to be one one day. It ain't going to be Palestine. It is going to be Israel. And those two sticks have come together as one, and they have been brought together to witness what God is going to do in that valley of decision, in the valley of Megiddo and Armageddon. Which brings us to the final point, is the protection. In Joel chapter 2, verse 18, It shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim. And then it goes on to tell us that as we go over to chapter 3, chapter 3, and let's go ahead and look at verse 16. Chapter 3 and verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop the new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. A fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, shall water the valley of Shittim. Saw that just a moment ago. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem 
from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And that is some exciting things to come. I told you partial fulfillments. You think about what Judah went through as Syria and Babylon has come in, has decimated the land. And you know, Israel did respond. They returned. They got back some of what they lost. Uh, currently today, once uh, the Babylonian and Assyrian sieges end, the land is healed. The crops begin to grow. Today, 9.3 million people live in Israel on 8,550 square miles. They have a gross domestic product of $372.31 billion. Fruit and vegetables and grain are easily grown in Israel. Their chief export, any idea what the chief export is out of Israel? Diamonds. And I think about that song, Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. And that is their chief export. Pentecost was compared to Joel chapter 2 by Peter. But it was only just partial. The complete fulfillment is yet to come. Tonight, as we finish out those verses there in Joel, the day is coming where the Lord's voice is going to roar out of Zion, where He is going to sit upon the throne of David in Jerusalem. That day, folks, is so close to coming. You say, well, how close is it? I've said this before in this series. I can tell you this, it is as close as about seven years away. It makes sense, right? If the Lord Jesus Christ was to come back tonight, we're out of here. Seven-year tribulation period. Rough, it is possible that in roughly seven years, by 2028, it could be the millennial kingdom. Could be, don't say, and it's on video, so if anybody comes back and says, oh, our preacher, he's, he's predicting dates. Nope, you got the video, it's on video, you can go back and listen to it. I'm not predicting, I'm saying that's a possibility because Jesus Christ could come back even now. You say, well, why doesn't he? Boy, don't we ask that often. Why doesn't he? The father hasn't said, go get your children yet. He hasn't sent him yet. The day is coming. Christians, that, that is God's plan of love and redemption all just rolled into a beautiful package in the book of Joel. But you know, you may be sitting here tonight and you hear this and it frightens you and things like that. And you know what? If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, I would be very afraid of prophecy too. I mean, there's good reason it ought to scare you, because should you be alive when the trumpet call sounds, that's what you're going through. And you say, well, I'll get saved then, not according to 2 Thessalonians. The Bible says you'll believe a lie. In this time of grace where you've heard the truth and, 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 and God's loving care and gracefulness to your life, He has called you, and you told Him no. What makes you think that sometime down the road, when things are that bad during the tribulation period, that, oh, now I'll say yes? It's not going to happen. Now is the time of salvation. This is the time. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, tonight needs to be the night of salvation for you. Give us an opportunity to take you aside and open God's Word and introduce you to the Savior that loves you so much that He died on a cross for your sins. And his blood was the payment for your sins. And as he hung upon that cross, he dies and he's buried in a tomb and he arose from the grave. It's his plan of salvation. That's what Jesus did so that you could have life. Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, tonight as we look at this great promise of Scripture, we are thankful, Lord, for your love for us. We are thankful, Lord, for the gift of salvation and that it's so crystal clear. Tonight, if there's one here without Jesus as their Savior, we pray that even tonight, Lord, that they would come under uh, your Holy Spirit conviction and that they would surrender to you this evening. As believers in Christ, we have much to look forward to. And that day is drawing very, very close to where this trumpet would sound. We need to be found faithful, 
serving you. May that be truly said of our lives tonight. We pray in Jesus' name.